The Tom Woods Show, episode 476. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Want to learn a highly marketable skill in your spare time in a way that's rigorous and yet fun and engaging and inexpensive? Then learn web technologies at Code School. Get your free account through tomwoods.com slash code. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here. We're talking about Keynesianism today and Say's Law. Say's Laws from the 19th century. We'll be telling you all about it. But the controversy over Say's Law really gets to the heart of the issues that we have with Keynesian economics. And joining us to clear all this up and explain it for us is Dr. Stephen Cates, who is Senior Lecturer in Economics at RMIT University in Australia. Steve Cates was the Chief Economist for the Australian Chamber of Commerce for 24 years and a commissioner on the Productivity Commission. He's the author of many books, including the one we'll be talking about today, Say's Law and the Keynesian Revolution, How Macroeconomic Theory Lost Its Way, but also Free Market Economics, an introduction for the general reader. Steve Cates, welcome to the show. And thank you very much for having me on. I've just been telling people about your work and your book we're going to talk about today. I have a wide array of listeners of all different backgrounds in terms of uh, knowledge of economics. Some of them, I'm sure, already know what Say's Law is, but some don't, and we could all use a refresher. So leaving out the Keynes question, just give me the explanation of Say's Law the way Say himself would have explained it. Um, well, the way it was explained, and I don't like using Say's version because he didn't, even though it's named after him, was named in the 1920s after him, he didn't actually give it the best explanation. Um, the best explanation you find is in John Stuart Mill, and almost identically good is in his father, James Mill. And the point about Say's Law was this, and it went through the entire classical school right up to 1936, and it said, you... Whatever may cause a recession, it will never be a deficiency of demand. And that, of course, is a complete anathema in a modern economic environment where it's always assumed that the problem is a deficiency of demand. But what Say's Law said, it never was. And the phrase they used was, there's no such thing as a general glut, which is very archaic. But the actual meaning they meant was, in our terms, you never, ever have a recession because of demand deficiency, thousands of other reasons, but never for that. Well, let's say something about that idea of the general glut, though, because I think people can at least understand the idea of general overproduction, because from time to time we hear economic journalists of various stripes attributing downturns either in the present or in the past to general overproduction. There was just too much production, there was a general glut, and that led to the problems. The point that is made in Say's Law is that although you could have a glut in some sector, there could be entrepreneurial error in some sector, there's no general problem that there's just too much stuff in general. There could be too much of one thing, and that was an error, and they should cut back on the production of that. But the too much of one thing simply means that there was corresponding underproduction of something else that was demanded more highly. But there's no such thing as a problem of the overproduction of everything. But why? I can imagine people thinking that it sounds plausible that everybody just got too uh, optimistic and everybody produced too much of everything. Why is that not a problem, at least according to the classical economists? Well, you know, if, if you start with the first, the general glut debate, you know, it, it, it takes place in 1820. Now, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, 1760, everybody was going, wow, look at all this stuff we're pouring out. But if you think of 1820 by today's standards, the idea that they had so much that they could not possibly have absorbed any more is obviously ridiculous. Same thing now. You go back to, to when Keynes published a general theory in 1936. Now, by our standards, the living standards in the 1930s um, were pretty m minimal compared to what we now live through. And so what's always happened is people have always lived in the most abundant times ever, at least since the general, since, since the 
industrial revolution. We've always lived in a time when we are having, we have more than our predecessors had. Um, and so we always, it's always one of those arguments that you can possibly argue plausibly that we've run out of things to buy because we are just all so flush with everything. But the idea is, is, is probably stupid. We all know that no individual you can hardly think of has enough, wouldn't have more if they could have it. But to think of the entire societies in that way is, is absurd. And the idea that we somehow have no more capacity to, to actually invest and to build more, more, more productive investment is even more ridiculous. It may be easier to see the point of Say's law when we imagine a barter economy. I've got potatoes and you have baseball bats and somebody else has oranges or whatever. If if we if the orange guy produces more oranges and I produce more potatoes and so on, this is not a disaster. It means that now there's more stuff for us to exchange. That maybe any one of my potatoes now exchanges for fewer oranges or something because there's greater abundance. But it's not like we have to look at each other and scratch our heads and say, oh, no, we're drowning in potatoes and oranges. It's, it's, a, great, it's a great thing that now I can just exchange my potatoes for, for some more oranges and, and, and so on and so forth. There's, so, there's a problem that's introduced supposedly, though, when money comes into the picture. Was this part of Keynes's issue that, that, that money somehow screws up the adjustment process? Well, I, I only wish it were. Um, the the classical economists were well into that, understanding how uh, how 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 important it was to understand the the nature of the exchange economy. But 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 what the classical economists were always at pains to do is to to make sure people understood that it is production that creates the ability to demand. Unless we are all producing, you can't buy. Unless each of us individually is producing and earning an income, then each individually cannot buy. So that for the for an exchange economy, there is you have to first understand it in terms of the actual products. I always think of it as a fruit bowl, but like your oranges and potatoes, but it's the same idea. There is so much going into the fruit bowl and so much coming out, but it's what we have. Um, a classical economist would then say, but this exchange problem will be interrupted by, by the, the fact that there is money and credit, and this can truly distort the way the economy actually unfolds and, and, and can cause individuals who are thinking, well, I think I can sell X, Y, and Z um, to get into an overproduction of particular items. And if you go back to GFC, it was, of course, the housing market that, that, that in the United States that, that just they were producing far more than the actual demand could, could carry in terms of what they would be actually willing to pay for. They couldn't afford what was being produced. So you had this distortion. But the problem always understood in the classical terms was that it was the existence of money and credit that caused these things to happen, that would cause these distortions. Um, there are other possibilities like the, the, the oil, the oil sh um, shock back in the 1970s. They, that's the sort of thing that can also cause a recession. But generally speaking, it was something that went wrong with, the, with money and credit. And the whole process of real production would be distorted. And some things would just find cannot be sold at prices that would cover their costs. What Keynes did, and this is a terrible disaster for economics to this day, I think, is he brought money in right at the beginning. He began with the idea of money. And so what we have lost sight of is the real production that sits underneath the money exchange. And because of that, we don't tend to see what is going on in the real economy. All we look at instead is the money side of it. All right, I, def I do want to get to Keynes in a minute. I want to say something about this popular rendering of Say's Law, where you sometimes hear it expressed as supply creates its own demand, which is, you've written a whole article on where that formulation came from, but it's so misleading because it makes it sound as if Say's Law is saying that all you need to do is produce something and there will automatically be demand for it. But, but the, what was actually being said was that if <laughs> if you're concerned about making sure that uh, you know all the oranges get bought the more you produce 
the more wherewithal you bring to the marketplace to be able to buy those those uh, those oranges. So the demand for oranges comes from my production of potatoes. So that my production, my supply creates the demand that I bring to the marketplace. Uh, so that's what that phrase should mean. But it creates a lot of confusion in people's minds because of supply creates its own demand sounds like a ridiculous, idiotic, uh, moronic view that, of course, we are well rid of today in our modern society. Well, the, the, the fact of the matter is, and it's one that, again, I, I don't know if you want me to get into this just yet, but the phrase itself, and this is one of the things I find so extraordinary, the phrase itself comes from a book written by an American economist in 1933. It's not like this classic tradition. It's written by a guy named Harlan McCracken, who was at the University of uh, Minnesota at the time, ended up in Louisiana. And he wrote this phrase, but he was being critical of Say's Law. Um, he was saying, well, the economy don't really work. And so the phrase has come into economics as, as the meaning of Say's Law was first stated by someone who, who, who didn't accept Say's Law and then taken up by the the single most important person who was opposed to say his law, and that being Keynes. Um, the core point of say's law was that demand is made is is caused by supply. You must supply to be able to demand, which is obvious. And then it says that whatever might happen, we are never going to end up in a recession because we've been supplying too much. We'll never ever be able to be in a position where we've just created so much wealth that nobody wants to buy anymore and we don't need people to, to work and produce it. All right, let's let's say something now about about Keynes. First of all, do you think he misstated or misunderstood Say's law? Or was he just overturning what he truly understood to be the real Say's law? Or was there a misunderstanding? Because I, I know in Henry Hazlitt's critique of Keynes, he's of the belief that Keynes is critiquing his own faulty understanding of Say's law. Is that also your view? Uh, my own view is that Keynes perfectly well understood it. He perfectly well. He, uh, he has this passage in the general theory, which, um, which, he, which, which he describes a classical view. And he says, oh, look, we've forgotten effective demand. We've forgotten all about that. We've just gone in this tradition of, of, of David Ricardo. And he perfectly states it. He doesn't call it Say's Law. That's not what he calls Say's Law, but he gets the point exactly right. But he's a polemicist. Keynes does not intend to actually explain this to you so that you will say, aha, let, let's debate the issue. He wants to actually cloud everyone's minds. Up until the Keynes publishes his book, everybody accepts in some way that you can't have overproduction, demand deficiency does not cause recession, you then have the, the, the Great Depression, um, and uh, everybody sort of loses track of what's going on in the economy, they just lose it. And so what you end up with is, is a, um, uh, a uh, Keynes being able to if you like, bamboozle people. It's, it's the circumstances of the times that allows it to happen. And without that, you could never have gotten something as ludicrous as people um, don't want to buy because they just prefer um, to, to save instead. You could never have gotten it up past the economics community who all understood what was wrong with that. Except, and this is the big exception, those who are under 30. And those who are under this was a kind of a lever revolution from below. What, what, though, is the best way to convey this to a general public that will find it at least superficially plausible that an economic downturn could occur because people, let's say, become skittish about spending and the demand for products is not what people anticipated that it would be, and that goes to show that deficient demand really is at the heart of an economic downturn. What's the, what's the flaw in that thinking? Well, you see, no, you see, it, it's the difference between what causes it and what the superficial appearance is. So what causes it? We have never, ever had a recession that you could say, ah, this has obviously been caused by people just not wanting to buy. Um, the global financial crisis happened in a kind of a quasi-boo. Everything was going really fantastic, except the housing market. This is your partial glut. Your housing market in the U.S., um, um, 
went into a downturn. This led to repercussions in the financial market, and it then transmitted across the globe. We had these international circumstances where economies were going into recessions because of a credit freeze. There was credit freeze across the world. Now, no one can describe that as a fall in demand in the sense that the problem was caused because all of a sudden everybody said, oh, you know what, i would come to think of it, I'd rather save. What really happened was that businesses around the world found they couldn't get credit to run their businesses. And, and, and there was this massive downturn that happened everywhere and is continuing um, to, uh, because the very way we tried to fix it is actually making the problem worse. But is there a part of the business cycle that in which we do see a curtailment of consumer spending? Yeah, that is what you you, you the the it was always understood. I mean, you, no one could miss it that that when you ended up in a recession, there was a fall in consumer spending, and there was even larger fall in investment spending. That's what you see. So, but is this why is this why people think that the the downturn is caused by the fall in consumer spending? Yes, it looks really plausible. That's like that's the, that's the stupidity of it. It looks yes, of course, that's so obvious. And if you go right back to the beginning of the literature, everybody is recognizing here you are in recession, and and nobody's buying all these stuff, all the stuff, all the goods we're producing piling up in our warehouses and no one's buying it. And so you need an explanation of why weren't people buying? Because people do want things. Why aren't we buying? And so what developed was a a, a theory to explain the fact that you have these mistakes made by businesses, like when the like with the housing industry in the United States. You have mistakes, you have distortions that happen in the economy that have to be rectified. Certain things would like the, the housing industry had to contract, certain 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 shifts in the underlying what we produce and how we produce and where we produce it had to take place, and then the economy would resume. Along comes Malthus in 1820, and he, he writes his book and he says, look, you know, the problem is that people are choosing to save. And so you have what's called this general glut debate, and it goes on between 1820 and 1848. And at the end of it, everybody just pounds the daylights out of Malthus. Everybody looks at this thing, and they say, you know what? There is no such thing as a general glut. Whatever ever it was that might have caused people not to buy, it never was because people decided to save. And so... Um, the, the fact that it looks that way is a large part of the problem. But there are two, I, I, if you're interested, I got two particular ways to talk about this. So, you know, people said when I was being taught this stuff way back in the 60s, that they would say, you know, the great proof of, the, of, the, of, of Keynesian economics came at the beginning of World War II. Everybody was still in recession, particularly Americans, because they used the Roosevelt New Deal to try to get out of the Great Depression, and it never worked. Um, but there they were. So we were in 1941. Everybody starts, to, uh, the government starts to spend, economy picks up, no more unemployment. Okay, so that's the story. But the real story, the one that I find fascinating, is the one at the end of World War II. So here you are, 1945, and the same Keynes are coming to, 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 to President Truman in this case, and they say, look, what we have to do now is, is maintain spending because we have these huge deficits we existing now, these massive deficits already. Um, um, public spending has been huge, and that's why we've been able to wipe out unemployment. But look, if we cut out all this public spending, at the same time as all these soldiers are coming back from overseas, um, we're going to end up straight back in the Great Depression. You must maintain public spending. And so what does Truman do? He says, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm this kind of simple soul, and I don't think we should maintain spending. And so what he did in 1945 was he balanced the budget. He just did it. He just said, okay, no more of the spending. Public spending just cascaded down. Um, the budget was balanced, and as we all know, it touched off the greatest period of economic prosperity and growth in history. It went right through the 1970s. It wasn't the deficit that, that you needed. It was actually getting rid of it, and that starts things going. Um, the other one, of course, is right now. You know, the, the, I just saw the statistics yesterday um, that 
the participation rate, the proportion of males in the labor force now is at the lowest rev level it has ever been. And we're going all the way back to 1948. And it's the lowest level it's been since 1948. And you know, sure there's people getting older so, so that there are a, a, a lot of people live longer so there's a portion there, but it's well beyond that. If you actually break the stats down, you can see that what is happening now is that you have this huge falling out of labor force. People can find jobs and they just give up looking. The stimulus, the supposed stimulus we put in in 2009 and, uh, and was done by everyone, everybody has reversed it because it did not work. The problems it has created are still with us, but no economy went into recovery because of this, this, this stimulus. And, and it was just as obvious as anything to a classical economist and is completely invisible all, to almost all macroeconomists today who follow Keynes. Steve, let's pause for just a moment for this message. Folks, it's a tough economy out there, but at the same time, there's never been an easier time to acquire marketable skills. You've got the internet. And case in point is a place called Code School, which you can visit through tomwoods.com slash code. I'm intrigued by it. I've actually checked it out myself. You can become a web developer. You can become a better web developer than you already are. You can design apps. You can be in, involved in web design. The sky's the limit. And you can learn it cheaply, at your convenience, and in a way that's actually enjoyable. As a matter of fact, a listener of this show wrote into me and said, I think it's awesome you're promoting self-taught web development stuff on your show. That's the field I'm in, and it's amazing to me how scarce the talent is. I've seen motivated friends of mine change career paths, self-teach, and land great jobs within six months' time. Definitely a great career. Get your free account through tomwoods.com slash code. The episode you mentioned with Truman in World War II has been cited by a man I'm sure you're familiar with, Bob Higgs, who says that it, this is probably the best empirical example of Keynesianism in action that you could possibly ask for, given that so many Keynesians in the United States, including Alvin Hansen, predicted that there would be mass unemployment at the end of World War II. And they said you have to keep producing tanks even though you don't need them anymore. They said this. They predicted it. The exact opposite happened. What more could you ask for than that? Now, of course, they didn't you know, fold up their tents and go home. They kept on going. That's the way people seem to be, unfortunately. But in other words, the nature of this dispute here between the Keynesians and – let's say, the modern-day heirs of the classical economists who have taken what they were saying and refined it and purged it and, and built on it, people like the Austrian economists, is that the Austrians are looking at the kinds of spending, the channels that the spending is, is moving in, as opposed to simply raw numbers of overall spending, giant aggregates, uh, looking, at, looking at a big number and trying to push it push it upward, and instead looking at patterns. Where's the money going? Wh which sectors have been artificially bloated and need to come back down to size, and which other sectors need to expand correspondingly? I, I feel like I must be oversimplifying the nature of the debate, but am I? Well, you know, I, I, my problem all the way along is that I have found people impervious to seeing, even seeing the point. Austrian economics carries on the classical tradition um, the transitional text is by Menger, Karl Menger, 1873, I think, or something like that. It's a transitional text. And it is, when, for me to read it, it is just a classical. But the interesting thing, I don't know how interested you are in this part, but the interesting thing for me is the reason I got into reading Mill, I, I, re, I picked him up by accident, and suddenly I realized I'm reading an 1848 book that is a refutation of Keynesian economics. And when I finally, after many years, unscrambled it, turns out that Keynes gets the idea of demand efficiency from Malthus, so that Mill, for all practical purposes, is trying to explain what's wrong with Keynesian economics. But by the time you get to Menger, the interest that they had then, that had gone. The, the general glut debate had been resolved. No one was going to argue that demand efficiency caused recession. But the new problem 
was the Marxism and socialist views that, that somehow, and in fact, interesting, Marx is one who argued, like Keynes, that overproduction was the cause of recession. So here you had the Austrians who were dealing with a different kind of problem. They were trying to explain what was wrong with socialism. And so that the, the same kinds of arguments um, that, that, that had existed um, when dealing with the general glut debate suddenly were reconfigured to aim and explain what was wrong with socialism and why, in particular, the labor theory of value didn't work. So the marginal productivity theory of, 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 of wages and distribution gets, gets, gets crafted to explain a different kind of issue. But the funny thing is that while they were doing that, um, to some extent, the eye was taken off the ball of the original issue, which was the general glut issue, the, 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 the Keynesian demand deficiency issue. And so by the time you get to 1936, um, the, the, the original notions behind um, why the general glut had been argued out, why people had agreed that demand deficiency couldn't happen, all that is gone. And so it's only a weak read. And Keynes just blows it over. It doesn't, there, there isn't that kind of understanding, um, especially amongst the younger generation of economists who are coming up. And so you get this thing established. And to go a bit further, what establishes it? You have Keynes writes this really obscure book. I mean, really obscure, very difficult to read. Even today, even today, when you think you know what he's saying, it's a difficult book to read. In 1937, you get a paper put up by a guy named John Hicks, and this has become the staple textbook explanation of Keynesian economics. It's pretty good, but it's not. But what he called it's not a proper explanation of classical economics. But he calls it Mr. Keynes and the classics, and he pretends he's explaining both. And then along you come to 1948, and Paul Samuelson invents the. Uh, the, 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 the 45 degree line on Y equals C plus I plus G, the, the basic economic framework that every student of economics learned for the subsequent 35 years. And so it just drilled into your head. Get economists for the first seven years of his life, and you, uh, for seven years you got him for life. This is how it worked. And so to this day, it's impossible. I find it impossible to get people to see that demand cannot possibly create the, the supply that they're of the buying. Supply is created by business people who are trying to think, what would those people out there buy? They produce and then they find out whether they're right or wrong. But it never demand that pulls it, but supply that pushes it. And of course, in order to, to demand anything, you can't just stomp your feet in the colloquial sense of the word demand. You have to have something with which to demand. You have to have the fruits of some previous production yourself in order to, to demand anything in exchange. And so production is, of course, at the heart of it. And once you get that basic logical priority of production over consumption, it becomes so much easier to understand real economics. And yet it's such a simple insight that I, I have to feel like maybe I'm just not sophisticated enough to understand what the Keynesians are saying. Surely they can see what I see. Ah, uh, but you see, everybody can see that if they had, whatever amount of money they had now, they had more, they'd be able to buy more. So it's true for any individual. Um, in the same way as, you know, the gov if a counterfeiter goes out and counterfeits some money and goes and spends it, well, they haven't, they, they haven't produced anything, but they can spend. Same for an individual. The point about all of this was that it's an aggregate issue. It's a national economy issue. It's a whole economy. So that you, so for any individual, we can be given money by the government. We can be paid welfare, and that's great. We can just say, well, fantastic. We have more money I can spend. And it looks as if it just requires somebody to give me money. And behind it all, the actual structure of the economy and the whole lot of it and Everything there that allows your money to be turned into goods and service is totally forgotten. And this is part of the way that I think Keynesian economics is able to be sold because it looks as if you give me more money, you give me an extra thousand dollars, I can spend more and I can buy more. But if you give everybody an extra thousand dollars, you can't do nothing happens because everybody just goes out with that extra thousand dollars, spends the money, and there's still no more extra there in society from which to buy. 
you know, I want to, before I let you go, I, I, pr- I probably should let you go now, but, but too darn bad. I got one more question for you. What about th- the issue of hoarding? Even today, you will sometimes hear Keynesians who have nothing good to say about the so-called hoarder, which is simply somebody who's added to his cash balance beyond a level that the Keynesian considers reasonable. What is the alleged crime of the hoarder, and why is it actually something that does not have, I assume in your view, bad economic consequences? You could imagine people thinking it does. If this hoarder isn't contributing anything, he's not keeping the circular flow of money going, and so therefore he's leading to a slowdown and a downturn, and that's, that's bad. Why is it not bad? Well, you see, the, the again, you know, I, it's, it's one of those ideas that everybody thinks of saving in a sense of saving as putting money away. It's a non, it's a non-active, it's something you're doing. So if I personally save, anybody saves, they say, aha, I take my income, whatever it was, and I take part of that and I put it in the bank and therefore I just might as well take that money and put it in a strong box and bury it in the backyard. So saving for an individual is clearly someone not spending. But if you say, okay, that's great for you as an individual, how about we talk about national saving? How does a country save? How does the whole of the United States save? What does the United States do to save? We're talking about national savings. What is that? And obviously, it's not the America going out and putting money in the bank. America doesn't put money in the bank. The government doesn't put money in the bank. That's not what causes a national saving. What national saving is, if you understood it properly, national saving is using your resources. Forget about money. Using your resources in a productive value-adding way. Now you say, ah, why are, but maybe these people don't want to use the resources. Why aren't they using resources? The reality is, of course, that, that, if you own capital, as in a machine, you actually have a, a, a shop front, say, and you are renting out your shop to, to, to somebody who comes by and wants to put up a store or a restaurant or whatever, um, and your previous tenant moves out, you don't go, oh, well, you know, forget about that. Nobody hoards the actual physical assets that they can use to earn money. Money just turns over. No matter what you do, if person over here A has a thousand dollars and he gives it to person over here B and they have, so A has a thousand less and B has a thousand more, well, we still got the same thousand dollars. The money still exists. The money doesn't disappear. But the question that really is at the bottom of it is what's happening to resources? National saving, if you think of savings in terms of the national economy in relation to money, you've completely lost the plot. You will not see what's going on because national saving has to be understood as that proportion of your resources that you're using for investment purposes. That's how the, that's how the classical economists thought about it. And a Keynesian model only thinks about new, newly produced investment goods. They forget about the entire infrastructure that's been here from time immemorial. We have roads and electricity generation plant that has existed for tremendous for years and years and years. And these are what constitutes your saving. When they are used to produce value-adding goods, when your electricity is driving factories and, 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 uh, and, and, and turning on lights and businesses, this is what saving actually is. We are using resources, part of the productive process. But if you go and you think with money, like, like I, I've heard so often, you have lost the idea what's underneath it. You couldn't even begin to explain what saving consists of. Hoarding, of course, during a recession when things are really bad, everybody sort of becomes a bit more wary, and that has always been the case. But that is not the same thing as hoarding, as a Keynesian described it, which is hanging on to money, which is absolutely a ridiculous way to think about an economy which is actually built on the product underneath the underlying productivity, which is what drives our, our, our economic prosperity. So in other words, by saving, I'm what I'm really doing is freeing up resources, making resources available for people who want to invest them in the expansion of some production process or 
or the purchase of capital equipment or whatever, by my not expending the resources, I am making them available for the productive expenditure by somebody else. That, that That's a better way to think about the act of saving. That's right. It's perfect way. It's the only way. I tell you, you said it exactly right. That's exactly right. If you, if you think of it in terms of money, you're just going to lose it. If you think of it in terms of what are our resources being used for? Are they be, I mean, Solyndra is a perfect example. So, oh, look, we, we're, we're pouring our money into this, 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 um, this asset, which, of course, the cost of it is well beyond the, any benefits you're ever going to get out of it. So it's not even just you're using your resources. You have to be using them in a value-adding kind of way. But before you can use the resources, there has to be, just like you said, that saving. And the saving actually exists in real terms and not in money terms. Well, Stephen Cates, I appreciate your time and your willingness to figure out the uh, time zone issue between us here on two <laughs> sides of the world. Uh, very kind of you. I'm going to direct people to your book, uh, Say's Law and the Keynesian Revolution, How Macroeconomic Theory Lost Its Way. We'll link to that on today's show notes page. This is episode 476, so it'll be tomwoods.com slash 476. I'll also link to uh, your work on this, your articles that people can read, and to your, I, I suppose you have a professional page I must have here in my notes. I'll link to that as well. Thanks again for your time. We all appreciate it. And thank you very much. Appreciate it myself. All right, everybody, on today's show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 477, I'm going to be linking to some additional information from Professor Cates on this subject that will supplement the information that we discussed here in the episode. So to get the full picture, to really supplement the conversation today, you'll definitely want to check out the material that will be linked over at tomwoods.com slash 477. Remember, too, you can get a free ebook, 14 Hard Questions for Libertarians Answered, by texting the word LIBERTY to 33444. And remember, too, I have a new free ebook coming out. I'm hoping to have it for you next month. That is September 2015. And it's going to be something along the lines of uh, why Bernie Sanders is wrong about everything or Bernie Sanders is wrong about everything, something like that, and I'll be giving that away for free too. i got a whole bunch of things I'm going to be giving away for free. So check that out. Uh, make sure you're subscribed to my little newsletter over at TomWoods.com. And also for guest ideas and topic ideas, a lot of people send me emails and people will say, well, this guy has some kind of out there scientific theory, but I think there's something to it. You should have him on. I generally avoid that because if, if I'm not qualified to evaluate the statements that are being made, I don't want to be made a fool of by some guest who's you know really not on the level. So I don't want to do that. But I've been taking some topic suggestions from people in the private Facebook group, the Tom Wood Show private Facebook group. So do please keep those coming, all you good uh, – Tom Wood Show listeners who are in that group. And if you want to join that group and get many, many other benefits like transcripts of all the interviews and many, many discounts and my Ron Paul curriculum courses and lifetime subscriptions to Liberty Classroom and many things besides autographed books and so on and so forth, you can check that out at supportinglisteners.com and warm my heart. Tomorrow I'm going to be doing the show by myself. I get a lot of people saying, do more shows by yourself. So, okay, I'm going to do one by myself, and it's... Uh, if, it's, if I am as effective in discussing the issues with you as the person who taught them to me was when I first learned them, your heads are going to explode tomorrow. So don't be driving while you listen tomorrow. Thanks for listening, everybody. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.